afternoon. I've got a lot of stuff up front for all of you, so thank you for having me for our first on-camera briefing. I think this is our fourth. Um, it's an honor to be with all of you. I appreciate everything you do around the world. Okay, first of all, Ramadan Kareem. As we look ahead to the end of Ramadan and the Eid holiday, it is important to speak up for the victims of China's massive campaign of repression against Uyghurs and other Muslim ethnic minorities in Xinjiang. The United States is alarmed by the arbitrary and unjust detention of more than one million people, widespread reports of torture and cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment, ever-present high-tech surveillance, and coerced practices contrary to people's faiths. Throughout this campaign, the Chinese government aims to force its own citizens to renounce their ethnic identities and their Islamic faith. The Chinese Communist Party has exhibited extreme hostility to all religious faiths since its founding. But even so, the repression of Chinese Muslims stands out as particularly cruel and inhumane during the holy month. The human rights abuses in Xinjiang must end, and they must end now. We call on the Chinese government to release all Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities arbitrarily detained throughout Xinjiang so that they may return home to celebrate the Eid holiday with their loved ones. Next, moving over to Iran. And we should have some graphics for you on this one. Our maximum pressure campaign on Iran is designed to deny the Iranian regime the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism, the means to conduct its destructive foreign policy. Our campaign is working. The campaign is starving Iran's proxies of the funds they rely on to operate on behalf of the regime. For the first time ever, Hezbollah, Iran's top beneficiary, has been forced to a publicly appeal for financial support. The Washington Post reported this month that our sanctions have forced Hezbollah to make draconian spending cuts. The images behind me depict Hezbollah's desperate plea for public donations via billboards, posters, and collection cans. Hezbollah's desperation is evident not only on the streets and in grocery stores, but also on the battlefield. Iran is withdrawing Hezbollah fighters from Syria and cutting or canceling their salaries. A fighter with Iranian-backed militia in Syria told the New York Times in March, the golden days are gone and will never return. Hezbollah isn't the only Iranian-supported force feeling the pinch of our sanctions. Hamas has enacted what it calls an austerity plan to deal with the lack of funds from Iran. The IRGC has told Iraq's Shia militia groups that their bankroll will dwindle and they must find new sources of revenue. The Assad regime now faces a fuel shortage crisis, having been cut off from the one to three million barrels per month since supplied, uh, once supplied by Iran. And the IRGC Cyber Command is short on cash. We will continue to apply maximum pressure on the Iranian regime to deny it the means to conduct its destructive foreign policy and compel the regime to negotiate a comprehensive new deal that addresses the full scope of its malign behavior. Now on to some better news. I would like to take a moment to congratulate two of the journalists who received Pulitzer Prizes yesterday in New York. Walon and Jia Su'u for their investigative reporting that uncovered evidence of extrajudicial killings of the Rohingya by soldiers in Burma. We were pleased that they could do so in person, having been recently released uh, from prison after more than 500 days. The United States continues to call on the Burmese authorities to drop charges against journalists and others for simply exercising their human rights, including freedom of expression. Freedom of expression is essential to any democracy. In Burma and around the world, the United States advocates for an end to violence against journalists and for the re release of journalists imprisoned for their work. Finally, one more, uh, some breaking news here. We welcome the news that Sirkan Golge has been released from prison today. We will continue to follow Mr. Golge's case closely, along with those involving our own locally employed staff at Mission Turkey. We take our obligation to assist U.S. citizens arrested abroad seriously, and we will continue to provide all appropriate consular services to Mr. Golge, including making sure he can return home as soon as possible. Out of respect for the family, we don't have any additional uh, details to share. Welcome back, Leslie. Thank you. <laughs> 
Should we start with you or Matt today? Well, you... I want to ask you something about uh, the Pulitzers. I guess that answers it. I think the name was Lady, but uh, I will give it to you, Matt. Um, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, there, yes, the two reporters were there from Reuters. There was a, um, mm -hmm. but since you're on the subject of Pulitzers and people being able to accept or their awards in mm -hmm. person, there was one winner mm -hmm. who was denied a visa. Yep. Colleague of mine. And what? No words about? No. You have you have nothing to say about that? Why would you? You know? Why would you? Law to who you allowed in gave visas to from Burma, but not for um, someone who who won a Pulitzer for mm -hmm. very um, for pretty <laughs> astounding coverage of the war in Yemen. We uh, visa recognition uh, records, as you know, are confidential under U.S. law, so I'm not going to have any further comment about that case. But we do think, in the case of the two journalists that were able to receive their Pulitzers in New York, that uh, the the work that they did and these prizes are laudable, and I think that that's a positive and happy thing that we can say here from the podium today. Well, be that as it may, not everyone who won was able to a a attend in person, and the reason that the, just one person couldn't attend was that you denied them a visa. So I just think that should be pointed out. Um, secondly, on China, unless you want to go to the Pulitzer's. No, if you're calling for this end to end, and it must end, it must end now with the Uyghurs, with the Muslims. Mm -hmm. Why have you been? Uh, why have you not invoked Magnitsky sanctions, which would really um, make the case to the Chinese authorities that what they're doing is something that you disagree with? Well, uh, we think that the weight of the words from the secretary and the weight of the words from this podium uh, have meaning. We, of course, don't preview uh, any sanctions, but uh, I think you've seen over the past few months, the secretary and now me giving a number of public interviews um, in which we have uh, called out uh, this behavior um, towards uh, uh, ethnicities and toward other Muslim major uh, minorities, excuse me, in China. And we think that that's um, appalling behavior, especially as we said, as we end, uh, get near the end of the holy month of Ramadan. And we continue to call it that behavior. We, of course, uh, have the human rights report uh, that came out in, in State Department's human rights report that came out on March 13th. Um, and it, it goes into detail about the uh, these human rights records as it relates to these camps. Um, so I think it's quite important that we call this out, both the Secretary and I. And we're not going to preview any sanctions here from this podium, but we're watching uh, these actions incredibly closely. I have, I have <coughs> not to do this. I actually, uh, the follow-up on um, the NASA scientist that was released. Do you think, do you believe that this is um, an indication by Turkey in any way um, to make good um, on the relationship, on what is, has been a tense relationship um, between the U.S. and um, and Turkey since uh, um, over this this issue? And do you think that it could lead to, do you think they're trying to, you know, score some points ahead um, regarding um, the, uh, the the weapons um Issue. I don't want to. Sure. Sorry. Uh, yes, understand. I don't want to speculate on the intentions um, of the Turkish authorities, um, but we want to commend them for doing uh, the right thing today by releasing Tim, him. We think it's welcome uh, news, and that should be done full stop because it's the right thing to do. Are there any others? Um, are there any other? I think there's one more, or it's a couple more um, uh, Americans that are detained. Is it? Uh, I don't know how, ex how many specifically, but we take the safety and security of all Americans to be the most important thing that the Secretary deals with. He raises it with leaders around the world um, every time he has these meetings, and we will continue to do so. Andrea. Thank you, and welcome, Morgan. Thank you. It's great to be It's intimidating to be, to be in front of you, but no, thank you. <laughs> no, it's, it's great for all of us to have you here. Uh, Defense, Acting Defense Secretary Shannon has yeah. now said that the firings from mm -hmm. North Korea were in violation of UN resolutions because they were short-range missiles. Mm -hmm. Does the State Department have a position on that? Well, uh, this sort of thing would be under the purview of DOD uh, uh, in any of these situations to make the call. Uh, that's not a call that the State Department would make. Um, I'm aware of the Secretary's remarks. I think they happened right before we came out. And, and again, I would refer you back to my comments yesterday 
um, that the entirety of the WMD program uh, that North Korea possesses in violation of UN sanctions. And we'll let our DOD colleagues handle those technicalities, but we remain focused on diplomacy. But the fact that they are in violation, uh, whether it's a red line or another you know, aspect of the President's policy, um, mm -hmm. the UN resolutions really do, um, do command the situation, do they not? Well, again, they have, they have been defying these UN resolutions for quite some time, but our focus here at the State Department is on eliminating this in threat uh, entirely. Um, I think the, the President has worked diligently, the Secretary has worked diligently to try to present an option to Kim Jong-un uh, and his leadership team for a brighter future for the North Koreans. Um, and so um, I don't I think I have a ton of follow-up yesterday other than that, something that the Secretary and Steve Began, who I talk to on a daily basis, remain committed to. And are there any talks scheduled at the Began level at this point with their counterparts? I don't have anything publicly to forecast. Hey, go ahead. Um, oh, <clears throat> sorry. What are you, are you going to ask on the same topic or different? On Iran. You want to know North Korea? And then I'll go to you next and we'll go to Iran. I don't have a ton else on North Korea today, but this can but be the last Ambassador one. Bolton said over the weekend. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. The U.S. hadn't heard very much from North Korea, and that Steve Began in particular has not had a response from North Korea. Is that an accurate statement? What? So, so say the first part again of what that, you said. That Steve Began hasn't had a response from North Korea. Uh, I don't think that um, I don't think that Began would characterize it uh, that way. I mean, I think the talks um, and the communication are ongoing, and that's how he has described it to me. Okay, let's go to Iran. Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, we're done on North Korea. Thank you. Can you confirm that um, the administration has warned Europeans that their mechanism to circumvent the uh, U.S. sanctions on Iran in sticks mm -hmm. could be itself subject to U.S. sanctions? And if yes, what was their response? Are there uh, discussions ongoing on this? So you're. I think this story is a, is a few months old. You're talking about the. The instex yeah. uh, mechanism. Yeah, we would we would not be supportive of anyone evading U.S. sanctions, whether it's the Europeans or anyone in the in the world. Um, we clearly have a difference of opinion as it relates to the JCPOA with our European allies, but we work with them incredibly closely on a number of issues. Uh, we have the secretary has been on trying to remember at least two or three trips in the past month that, that I have been on with him. We have more coming up, which uh, some of you are aware of, and we'll give more detail on tomorrow. Um, and so, you know, we work with them on a range of issues. But as it relates to U.S. sanctions, whether it's on Iran or related to Venezuela or waiting, related to North Korea, we expect all countries, allies, friend or foe alike, to comply with U.S. sanctions. Hi, Oh, are you going to do Iran? No, ma'am. Can, I, can I go to Christina sure, and then to you on Iran? Thank you. Um, so with the waivers, uh, we've talked about oil waivers a lot, but we've got this Iraq energy waiver. It was granted a 90-day waiver to keep importing energy from Iran. That waiver runs out on June 16th at 12.01 a.m. Um, I'm wondering if the Secretary plans to renew that waiver. Mm -hmm. Iraqi officials have said it's going to take them up to two years to try to make up the difference if they lose that ability to import that. And does the U.S. have any kind of alternative for mm -hmm. Iraq if they say they can't import the energy anymore? Uh, so the Secretary has not made a decision on this yet. Um, on March 18th, he did grant a 90-day waiver, uh, as you said, to engage in financial transactions. I think it's important to, to note that those were related to electricity, not to gas, uh, from Iran. But um, he is the Secretary has not made a decision yet. I'll certainly let you know. Do so you want to move on? Yes, topic. sir. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, it's fine uh, with me. Thank you for taking my question. Yes. Um, uh, tonight, you know, by tonight, by midnight, maybe in a couple hours, we will know whether the Israeli government, the current uh, mm -hmm. the prime minister, will continue to be in his post or not, or there will be a call for a new election. Uh, my question to you is, in the event that there is a call mm -hmm. for a new election, will the conference in Bahrain uh, scheduled for the 25th and 26th of June, is it likely to go on as scheduled, or how will that impact, in your mm -hmm. opinion, how will that mm -hmm. impact? The, the conference. Yes, I understand. So um, Israel is certainly a thriving, vibrant democracy, and I'm not going to step my toe in the middle of their uh, coalition forming process. As it relates to Manama, of course, you know, the White House does have the lead on that. They have not told me um, of any changes uh, related to Manama, and I'm not um, anticipating any. Okay, and one quick question on the sure. Palestinian issue. Uh, last week, uh, the uh, I think it was reported by the Associated Press that the State Department was following the deportation case of uh, a human rights activist uh, in Israel, uh, Omar Shaka. 
yes. I, I wanted to follow up whether uh, how are you following up mm -hmm. in this case? Uh, is there anything new? He's a U.S. citizen. Uh, well, the embassy has continuously engaged on this case. Of course, we're all waiting for the Israeli Supreme Court's decision, um, and I don't think that we will have an update until we see the outcome um, of that decision. Uh, but we have discussed this case with the Israeli government. BBC? Uh, I have a question about Syria, but first, if I can just follow up what Francesca was asking. So has the U.S. warned the Europeans that INSTEX, the, me the mechanism itself, is, could be subject to sanctions? Um, I would need to check with the Secretary on, on that specific mechanism. Um, I think that any mechanism that violates U.S. sanctions will not be tolerable. And then about Syria, when the yes. uh, Secretary was in Russia, he said mm -hmm. that he had reached some understandings with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov mm -hmm. about uh, northwestern Syria or Idlib, um, and yet we see the Russians and the Syrians bombing um, civilian targets. So were those yeah. understandings, what, did he misunderstand Mr. Lavrov or did they fall apart or what happened there? Well, I think it's an ongoing discussion um, that we have with our uh, Russian counterparts. Um, Ambassador Jeffrey is in New York today um, discussing the political situation in Syria. He's meeting at the UN Security Council. He also uh, has, uh, has met with uh, UN Special Envoy Peterson, who you all know, um, to discuss the political process and, and of course, the um, situation in Idlib. We spoke about this from the podium yesterday. We, of course, condemned these regime and Russian airstrikes. I think we have at least 300,000 uh, displaced already, uh, at least two, 273 civilians killed. Um, the situation has deteriorated. We think it's alarming. Um, and I think, you know, the, the Secretary will continue to have ongoing discussions with his Russian counterparts. None of this is going to be solved overnight, but we are clearly take note of this. We're alarmed by it, and we're going to call it out. Yes. Uh, Turkey's defense minister has said that Turkish military personnel we're receiving training in Russia to use the S-400, and Russian personnel may come to Turkey. Mm -hmm. What's your view of that? And can you tell us if the recent report that you've given Turkey a deadline very soon to cancel the S-400 deal is accurate? I think it's important to remember that Turkey is a long-standing NATO ally. They were certainly crucial to us uh, in the fight to defeat ISIS. Um, and so we, we appreciate that. However, I think I have been very candid and clear from this podium, and, and the Secretary has as well. We're willing to engage uh, with the Turkish government, but our position remains the same, that Turkey will face very real and very negative consequences if it completes the delivery of the S-400. This includes suspension of procurement and industrial participation in the F-35 program, and also, because of CATSA, uh, exposure to sanctions. Um, these, are, these are very serious. These are very real, and I think our position remains quite consistent on that. Thank you. Thank you. Has there been a deadline? Not that I'm aware of. Nick? Uh, to Qatar, uh, the, the Prime Minister of Qatar is going to Saudi Arabia for um, an emergency meeting there, and there's been some mm -hmm. speculation that Are you talking about the GCC meeting? Correct. Okay. Um, there's been some speculation that that mm -hmm. indicates there may be an end to the GCC crisis, and mm -hmm. the Qatar may be being brought back into the fold. Does the State Department have any insight into whether there has, in fact, been some sort of a breakthrough or progress on this standoff? We don't have anything to announce on that front. I mean, listen, I can certainly tell you from personal experience, many of you know I was Treasury's attache in Saudi for a year and a half, dealt very closely with the Gulf. And I know from my own perspective, having worked um, within the Gulf and, and, of course, this department's perspective, is that Gulf unity is essential uh, to confronting Iran's malign influence. It's essential to countering terrorism and, of course, in securing a prosperous future. Um, so it's imperative for, in our, in our view, for the GCC to be united uh, against regional threats and united on a number of issues. Um, and so we are uh, hopeful and that there will be good news out of this meeting. Can yes, I Adrian. On just on that mm -hmm. one point? Did um, we, the Secretary or anyone um, in this department, play a role in trying mm -hmm. to broker this? I don't know the answer. I know he was very mm -hmm. actively engaged when it first broke out. Mm -hmm. so uh, great question. I'll get the answer for you. Courtney. Thank you. Uh, has the department determined that Russia is in violation of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and has the U.S. contacted the Russians through diplomatic channels to discuss concerns over Russia's purported low-level nuclear testing? 
Um, are you, I am aware, and I think what you're referring to is probably the, the speech or the comments that were given from some NSC officials, um, uh, or perhaps some DOD officials, excuse me, at the Hudson um, Inst Institute today. So uh, that was DIA analysis, um, Defense Intelligence Agency, so I will refer you to them to, for further comments on theirs. Um, we have said, and I think we see this continue, that Russia routinely disregards its international security and arms obligations. Uh, we've talked about this quite extensively as it relates uh, to INF. They've been a material breach of INF. Uh, our European allies have concurred with us on this. They've been in breach for several years. Um, and they have tested, produced, fielded an INF weapon. So I'm going to let DIA speak on behalf of that uh, particular comments that they made today. Um, but we are certainly alarmed that they continue to disregard their international obligations uh, as it relates to arms control. Yes, Thank sir. You, Madam. India. Okay. Two quick, two quick questions, please. Yes. One, that was the, this was the uh, second time uh, U.S. asked India to cut off Iranian oils. First it happened during President Obama. Mm -hmm. Any alternative for the energy needs of India? Any alternative? Is that what yes, you said? Um, so we've worked, we've coordinated closely, of course, with them to, met, to minimize any negative impact. Um, and our goal, um, and what we've you know, said quite a bit from this podium, the Secretary and I have as well, is for everyone to cease uh, importing Iranian oil entirely. Um, and we appreciate everyone who has worked with us steadfastly to get to zero. And yes. second, Madam, Hi. quickly, if anybody going uh, tomorrow, Prime Minister Modi's inauguration from the U.S. I don't have anything to announce from there, but thank, thank you. you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Morgan. Uh, yeah. On North Korea, human rights uh, issue on North Korea, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there are uh, more me. than... <laughs> See what are, I do to get okay? ready for all of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are you ready? Yes, go ahead. All right, good. There are uh, 100,000 of uh, North Koreans right. trapped in North Korean uh, uh, political prisoner mm. camp now. What is the uh, U.S. final destination of the uh, North Korean's human rights you know, abuse in North Korea? Well, we clearly uh, do not, you know, stand or, or, or stand by any of these sort of human rights abuses in North Korea. And I think what we're really focused on, I think these things have been detailed. We've talked about it in our human rights reports uh, probably almost every year. I'd have to go back to see how many years going back into the date. So I think that we have a very detailed record on how we feel about those human rights abuses. But what I think it's important to point out is that we do see a bright future for the North Korean people. There is a path out of these economic sanctions. Uh, they do remain, of course, and they will remain in effect, but there's, they're, they're not forever. By the way, the same thing goes for, for other countries that may be under U.S. economic sanctions. There's a path forward. There's a way out, and we welcome um, Kim Jong-un and his leadership to see the bright future that we believe is possible for his people. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Bisan Abkhoy from Al Jazeera. Thank you for taking my question. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you about a colleague of ours, uh, Mahmoud Hussein. He has been detained in Egypt for over two years without um, any charges against him. And Could you say the name for me? One Mahmoud Hussein. Okay. And uh, just a couple of days, uh, a few days ago, he was told that he was going to be released, and they actually moved him to a uh, police station from uh, Tora Prison. And and then this was reversed mm -hmm. just yesterday. He, the, they were told by a judge that a case, mm -hmm. a, a new case mm -hmm. uh, is uh, against him now. So uh, we just wanted to see if you have any comments on Thank this you issue. for that question. I don't have a comment for you today, but we'll follow up you by, uh, by the end of the day on that. Sure. Um, Bing Ruan with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Say it um, one more time, sorry. Uh, my name is Bing Ruan with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Okay. Um, Secretary Pompeo has talked to Fox Business News in, um, extensively about Huawei and China. Yes. And um, so the accusations of the United States against the Huawei about intellectual property theft and espionage, etc. cetera. Um, mm -hmm. Huawei's chairman has asked the United States to provide evidence mm -hmm. to support this accusation. So I'm wondering if there is any concrete evidence to support the accusation. Um, so you're, of course, aware the uh, defense authorization was passed. Um, uh, as it relates to effectively banning these sorts of technology uh, used for, for procurement by the U.S. Uh, government, U.S. military especially, um, and that was predicated on quite a bit of evidence. I will double check into, of course, what's been made public, um, but I think what we see the underlying uh, issue here is that is it is within Chinese law that these um, 
all of these companies, these networks, these technology companies, um, they are subservient to this authoritarian regime. So if the regime, uh, excuse me, if the government, if the Chinese Communist Party asked for this technology or asked for this information, it's required by law for them to give it to their government. Um, and, and then, of course, in addition to that, technology experts have said that Huawei's products uh, are found, uh, have been found to contain hundreds of security vulnerabilities, uh, many of which remain um, that are that are not remedied. Um, so we think as as uh, we think countries should think about this as it relates to critical infrastructure. If you think about everyone is moving to smart cities. I worked on this issue for a while in the private sector. And so when you think about who controls. Um, your electricity, who controls the water, all of these things, the 5G network, um, which can revolutionize the way we do business around the world, the way governments function, the way cities function. It's definitely an incredibly exciting uh, technological advancement uh, that, that we see going around the world. However, the big red, red flag that we're holding up is that when you think about uh, what sort of technologies you're putting in to, as it relates to 5G, as it relates to running the critical infrastructure in your city, in your state, in your, in your province, wherever you may be in the world, you have to remember that those uh, technologies are subservient to authoritarian uh, regimes. Um, we have, of course, the U.S. government has uh, alleged that Huawei has stolen U.S. intellectual property, violated U.S. laws, and taken actions that reflect uh, quite negatively on our national security. And that's why I think we have such a hard stance. Yeah. Oh, I think I gave you a long answer on that, so I'm going to yeah. move well, on to the question. next one. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, back to Iran, you may have seen the comments by Iranian President Rouhani saying that the road is not closed to negotiations, and with President I concur. Trump also I saying that he would, you know, would like to negotiate. Do you see any way forward that there might be, with help of perhaps somebody mm -hmm. else, um, arbitrating or negotiating any way forward on that? I see 12 ways forward. I think that uh, we have been very explicit here. We do not want a war with Iran. We want to de-escalate with Iran. We do not seek uh, any of the things that have been alleged over the past few weeks. In fact, what we seek is to end economic sanctions, to end the maximum pressure campaign. That's where we want to get. We want the Iranian regime to see these 12 things that Secretary Pompeo laid out and to come to the table to talk to us, to behave like a normal nation. Stop with the assassination plots in Europe. It's intolerable. We will not stand for it. Stop supporting terrorism. Stop malign regional behavior. Stop trying to control Manama, uh, excuse me, Beirut, Damascus, Sana'a. There is a path forward, and we will talk tomorrow if they would like to see the bright future that we believe is there for the Iranian people. Are you willing to talk to them about anything other than the 12 points that the Secretary is? I think that would be a part of a comprehensive discussion that the secretary uh, would certainly be willing to have. I mean, we, we think that those – taking a realistic look at those, uh, those 12 points, stop being the world's largest state sponsor of terrorism, uh, behave like a normal nation, come into the international fold. We're willing to help you get there. Right. I know. But, I, well, if you're willing to help them get there, are you willing to talk to them to get to the point where you're – able to talk about those things. So what I mean is that are you willing to discuss confidence building measures, something short of any of the 12 steps, if that's on the road to talks about the 12? I think that the points. Secretary has made his position very clear that there is a, there is a path forward as it relates to these 12 steps. Uh, I don't think it's too much to ask for for them to stop trying to assassinate people on European I'm not soil. suggesting that it's not too much, yeah. that it is too much I don't, I don't I'm just wondering would, if, no, if you're willing your to talk to them about lesser I issues of importance to you on the way to those discussions. And then secondly, do they have to be direct talks? Are you willing to begin the process in an indirect through a, through a third party? Is, I don't think I, there are no plans or discussions of that that I'm aware of, um, and I don't think uh, in indirect talks. I, I think that there's no discussions or plans again that I'm aware of, um, and I would say that the secretary has made it quite clear um, the mechanism by which he would speak to the Iranians. Um, I think that we've discussed it very overtly. I think all of you are probably hot, tired of hearing me say the same thing, but we keep um, saying it because we think it's important. Let's follow up on that. Can we just go to somebody who hasn't gone yet? Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Sure. I'm Kyo Nakamura at Nikkei, Japanese uh, Great. correspondent. Thank you. Uh, the Japanese Prime Minister is considering a visit to Iran. Then, do you think that Japan would work as an intermediary 
to ease the tension between U.S. and Iran? Do you want an intermediary in the first place? And so the question is about the Japanese relationship with Iran? Uh, I mean, the Japan is making an effort to ease the tension mm -hmm. between U.S. and Iran. Do you support this action? So um, we welcome uh, the efforts by any country, uh, whether it's Japan, whether it's our European allies, to help de-escalate the situation. Uh, we encourage all of our allies, including Japan, uh, to remind uh, Iran that we do not want to see them get a nuclear weapon, that we do not want to see them fomenting terrorism and paying for terrorism around the world. And so if the Japanese uh, would like to reiterate that message um, on our behalf, we certainly welcome it. Sure. Um, these 12 steps, are they an ultimatum or are they an opening position to start talks? Yeah, preconditions or are they just the opening statement to get talks going? I think it's the open. I, I think we're, let me just say, I think we're reading a little bit too much into this. I think that uh, it's well, the opening statement. The steps are yeah, because I think that this is very, very things that we are asking every country to, to behave by. Uh, we're asking them, you know, not to terrorize the region. And we just don't think that's too much to ask for. Ben, NHK? No, we're going to go to Ben. Well, are you interested in Matt, getting we're Americans gonna go to ben. detained in Iran? Out we're going to go to Ben. Are you interested in getting Americans Ben, you can ask it if you want or you're going to lose your opportunity. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, I just want to get a comment from State Department. Uh, North Korea is criticizing the U.S. for these uh, for a nuclear test that was conducted back in February by Lawrence Livermore Labs. Do you have any comments? What did the North Koreans say? Um, I, I didn't hear you. They, they said that the U.S. is acting in bad faith uh, because they just conducted a subcritical nuclear test back in February? That would probably be a DOD question. Uh, I don't think I have an answer for you on that. <coughs> Hi, how are you? you Morgan. Sure. Uh, some critics say that the uh, arms sale to Saudi Arabia undermines the US values mm -hmm. and that there is no emergency for this deal. Do you have any, any comment on that? Well, uh, I believe that you are referring to the arms sales that were to uh, the United Arab Emirates, Jordan, and Saudi that we right. announced on Friday. And the question, do I have a comment about it? Uh, yeah, because some critics say that, uh, uh, that the arms sale to Saudi Arabia undermines U.S. values. Um, so, listen, we see this, we see the authority that uh, the Secretary used under Section 36 um, to be a one-time event. Uh, we'll continue to, of course, work. Uh, with Congress on this, on these, but we, due to the uh, deteriorating situation that we saw in the region, uh, directly related to Iran, of course, and their regional threats, um, we thought that we had to take this action because it helps uh, our partners better defend themselves. And given this crucial period that we're in, uh, delaying any of these shipments any longer, they've been delayed, I believe, for about a year and a half. Um, it could cause degraded systems, lack of necessary parts and maintenance concerns, and we certainly can't have our allies in that position whenever we're under heightened threat um, uh, from the Iranian regime. One more in the back. <coughs> What's your name? Oh, yes. Hi. Nice to see you. You, you ended up in the back this time. Yeah. <laughs> I had life before. Oh. Okay. Uh, that 12 demand, that 12 conditions. That oh, God. Are, we're still on that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that you are asking the Iranian. If they say now we are ready to debate, we are ready to discuss these 12 conditions, <coughs> are these 12 conditions debatable? Are you ready to discuss these 12 conditions? Question for you, back at you. Have you met Mike Pompeo? Yes. Do you think these 12 are debatable? No, I don't think. Thanks, but guys. I'm asking I'll see you, you tomorrow. tomorrow.